My name is Andrew Plaster, and you probably don't like me, or maybe you don't like what I do. Why do I say that? Because I'm a political pollster. And why do so many people say they don't like political pollsters? Historically, one reason people used to dislike political pollsters is that we used to call people on the phone during dinner and ask them a bunch of long, boring questions about politics. But you probably don't have a landline, and you probably don't answer your cell phone if you don't recognize the number. So that one may not apply to you. Another reason is that poll results are sometimes wrong. For example, during the 2016 presidential election. And so some people think that political surveys are either rigged, and some of them are, or deeply flawed, some of them are, and that this can be harmful to democracy. It can. Third, I'm a partisan hack. I work for democratic candidates and progressive organizations and causes. And fourth, some people just don't like politics or politicians for some very understandable reasons. And some people don't like what is sometimes called the Washington establishment. I could spend the next few minutes trying to justify my existence or try to explain why polls sometimes get it wrong or how to make them better. But the internet is full of people who talk about that. Many of them are friends of mine. Many of them are data, statistics, and analytics nerds like I am. And many of them have names like Nate or Dave. So I'm going to talk about something else instead. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of how we got where we are today. There's a lot of evidence that politics today is broken. Just look at the January 6 terrorist attack on the US Capitol and the fact that tens of millions of Americans identify with and support the terrorists. That is not a sign of a healthy democracy. There are also a lot of different opinions about what's caused these problems. There's not just one single cause, there are a lot of causes, which means that many of these opinions are probably right. One of the causes, according to some observers, is what I do. Political targeting, micro-targeting, polling, and the dark arts of political persuasion. And that's the one I'm going to talk about today. The theory is that political targeting, micro-targeting, polling, and political persuasion can lead to more division of the electorate and can lead to different groups of people operating from different sets of facts and opinions. The world is different today than it was 40 or 50 or 60 years ago, when there were three TV networks that all reported the same news from the same point of view and they all agreed on what was important to report on and what was unimportant, what was true and what was false, what was fair and what was unfair, what was right and what was wrong. And if Edward R. Murrow or Walter Cronkite or later on Tom Brokaw or Dan Rather or Peter Jennings said something was true, most Americans believed it. And there was an accepted set of boundaries. You could be a liberal Democrat or a conservative Republican or anywhere in between but you mostly operated from the same set of facts. And if you were outside of that spectrum, a socialist or a communist or an anarchist or a libertarian or a fascist, you were considered a conspiracy theorist and respectable people rejected you. And it didn't matter because the only way you could get your message out was by screaming on a street corner or sending unhinged manifestos to people in the mail or printing up some literature and putting it on people's car windshields or doorsteps. And if that's how your message was distributed, then most people knew enough to ignore it and throw it in the trash. That's no longer true. Now people with those views get to share them during prime time on cable television and satellite radio and podcasts and Facebook and Twitter, and millions of people like and share and retweet and amplify these messages. So part of what's changed is that virtually everyone now has access to platforms that allow them to distribute their message to millions of people. And the more outrageous the content in some cases, the more likely it is to be shared and distributed widely. But another part of what's changed is that we have a greater ability to hone and target our message to people we want to influence through the use of big data analytics and micro-targeting. And it may very well be the case that the critics are right and that this has helped make our politics more divisive and to make our country more divided. But what I want to share with you today is that the use of data and person level voter targeting is not actually as new as many people seem to think. In fact, 
very little of what we do today for political campaigns is actually new. Sure, some of the techniques are new, some of the technology platforms we use, or some of the data we collect may be new. But just as an automobile once replaced a horse for traveling from point A to point B, we use these new technologies and techniques to conduct the same activities that political campaigners have used for hundreds or even thousands of years. Negative advertising, negative campaigning, starting false rumors or fake news about your opponents, collecting and recording person level data on people's political views, targeted messaging, all of this has been around for hundreds if not thousands of years. Since long before we had Twitter, Facebook, internet, cell phones, cloud computing and database technology. A few years ago, I was meeting with a candidate who was running for parliament in India. I was telling him all about how we harnessed big data and analytics to help elect Barack Obama and the modern history of political polling, persuasion, data, and analytics. And the candidate asked me, but when did it start? When did all of this begin? If I had to guess, I would guess that it began in ancient Athens. I imagine that 3,000 years ago, there was probably a guy just like me with a piece of parchment or papyrus or a tablet, and he would go around talking to all the eligible citizens, asking them how they were going to vote and making a note of who was a supporter, who was an opponent, who might be persuadable, and what arguments or facts might help persuade the persuadable citizens. In fact, if I were to go back even further in time, I imagine there may have been some prehistoric tribes where decisions were made not solely by autocratic chiefs, but with input from tribe members. And in these tribes, there may have been chiefs or advisors or people who had an interest in the outcome of a political decision who talked to different members of the tribe to find out which position each person supported or opposed and who might be persuadable and tried to figure out how to persuade them. But that's just speculation on my part. The earliest campaign slogans that I know of are visible in Pompeii which means they are around 2000 years old. There are more than 1500 instances of political graffiti at Pompeii, which was simultaneously destroyed and preserved by a volcano in 79 AD. Here are some of those examples. Magonius supports Cuspius Panza for Adon, an endorsement. All the worshipers of Isis call for Helvius Sabinus as Adon, a religious endorsement. Innkeepers make Celestius Capito aid aisle, what we today would call occupation based or identity group targeting. And negative campaigning. The petty thieves ask you to elect Vasha as aid aisle. All the deadbeats and Masarius ask for Vasha as aid aisle. All the drunkards ask you to elect Marcus Serenius Vasha aid aisle. Florus ad fructus wrote this, which may be a disclaimer like saying Floris ad fructus approved this message. Elect Gaius Julius Polybius to the office of Adile. He provides good bread. Perhaps this is the first century AD equivalent of Herbert Hoover's chicken in every pot. And finally, we have the endorsement of the chicken vendors and the mule drivers. But when my Indian colleague asked me when this all began, I didn't go back to ancient Rome or Greece or prehistoric tribes. I only went back as far as Abraham Lincoln in 1840. In 1840, Abraham Lincoln was an Illinois state legislator, just like Barack Obama was 160 years later. And also like Barack Obama, Lincoln was a political organizer before becoming a state legislator. During the 1840 election, Lincoln co-signed a letter providing instructions on how to organize political activity at the county level. And I want to share part of that letter with you now. Lincoln and his co-authors open with red meat to rev up the base and get them to volunteer. The language you see here, overthrow the corrupt powers that now control our beloved country and overthrow the trained bands that are opposed to us. Sound a lot like the political rhetoric that we see and hear today. Once the supporters are hooked, the letter explains the strategy. Our intention is to organize the whole state so that every Whig 
can be brought to the polls in the coming presidential contest. Today, we call this voter mobilization, turnout, or GOTV, which stands for get out the vote. They go on, divide the county into small districts, appoint in each a subcommittee whose duty it shall be to make a perfect list of all the voters in their respective districts. Today, we call this a voter list. And to ascertain with certainty for whom they will vote, today we call this supporter identification. If they meet with men who are doubtful as to the man they will support, such voters should be designated in separate lines with the name of the man they will probably support. Keep a constant watch on the doubtful voters and from time to time have them talked to by those in whom they have the most confidence and also to place in their hands such documents as will enlighten and influence them. On election days, see that every Whig is brought to the polls. In addition to this letter, there are a couple other quotes from Lincoln that I want to share. The first is this one. Our government rests in public opinion. Whoever can change public opinion can change the government. And in this age, in this country, public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Whoever molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces judicial decisions. I wanted to share this letter and these quotes for a couple of reasons. First, they demonstrate that Lincoln was not just a great president, but also a great politician, organizer, campaigner, and strategist. Also, all the parts of a modern campaign are captured by Lincoln. Public opinion, targeting, endorsements, persuasion, fundraising, organizing, canvassing, data capture, strategy, confidentiality, vote counting, voter turnout, influencer identification, and deployment. Today, we may use technology tools and platforms such as Twitter, SMS, mobile phones, digital ad testing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. But everything we do today has the same purpose as what Abraham Lincoln was trying to do back in 1840. Identify your supporters, opponents, and persuasion targets. Turn out your supporters. Identify the most effective and efficient ways to persuade your persuasion targets. Deliver your persuasion message to your persuasion targets efficiently and effectively. Talk to voters, count votes, etc. That part is pretty much the same as it was 180 years ago. So what I want to suggest to you is that despite all the talk of 21st century targeted messaging, use of data and analytics to reach voters one-to-one -one and peer-to-peer, -peer, the basic functions of campaigns are remarkably similar to standard campaign practice nearly 200 years ago, or perhaps even 2,000 years ago. The technology may have changed, but the principles are very much the same.